Hello there, we are students from Bachelor of Arts Interior Architecture. We are Bo, Shero, Sharon, Naya, Cindy, Aisha, Liberty and Catherine. In the previous videos, we talked about who the Merlinau people are in part 1 to 3, and this video will be the final in this series. Located away from the cities. The Merlinau people, an indigenous group of people found near the rivers of Serok, Malaysia. Home to the Rajink rivers, they are the earliest settlers in the Serok state. Hidden away from the hustle and bustle of the city life, they are known as the people of the river. In this topic, we will be covering the economic activities of the Merlinau people. The Merlinau people have a wide range of economic activities living by the river. As a coastal community, the Merlinau people is known for fishing, farming, planting sago and trading via the river, providing their vital needs. As time passes, the Merlinau people found various ways to complement their traditional way of survival and picked up new ways to generate income. This topic will be segmentized to five different categories, that is the subsistence and commercial activities, trade, industrial arts, land tenure and division of labor. The first category, subsistence and commercial activities. As an example, subsistence agriculture is farming for daily necessity food to survive with a little surplus, while commercial agriculture is farming meant to provide a surplus with food and earn more money. As primary settlers in Serok, the Merlinau community survived by taking ownership of existing resources. Initially, they hunt wild animals and forage the nearby forest for sustenance. As the community progresses, they soon settled to the coastlines of Rajink and became fine boat builders and fishermen. However, as stated in the Encyclopedia of World Cultures, 2020, the swampy areas that the Merlinau people earn a living is frequently flooded during the northeast monsoon from November to March. This stops all their fishing activities from the coastal villages in January and February to ensure the safety of all fishermen. This means they will have to find another way for lasting sustenance during those perilous months. Once they discover that the sago palm can be found in freshwater swamps, especially in the Rajink Delta to make staple food, they extensively involved in its cultivation to produce sago, which is known as lamuntak, cornstarch, or known scientifically as metroxylon sagu. In the year 1578, the Sultan of Brunei appointed Merlinau representatives at the mouths of the most important sago-producing rivers, especially the Oyu and Mu Ka rivers, to control the sago trade revenue, as they are the most prominent inhabitants of the southwest coastal district. Because of this, the Merlinau people are well known as the sago producers of Serok, as they heavily involved it in their culture and even infused in their Alu Alu dance. The purpose of the Alu Alu dance is to comfort the family and friends of the deceased so as not to grieve. Interestingly, these dance moves do not have a specific movement, but their movements are actually based on daily actions which also included sago making. For example, the male dancers would stamp the bamboo poles to the ground as if to replicate the process of grinding the sago bits to pieces. The other most prominent dance that featured the sago making process is the Tarian Menyak, which is a traditional dance for sago making. For example, the rolled up mat is used to represent the trunk of the sago plant. So how is sago or cornstarch being made? Let us dive into the sago making process used by the Melanau people. Step 1, 2 Burn Palau. This means to fell or cut down a sago palm. The palms are to be felled when the stems are rich in starch just before flowering. One sago palm can yield from 150 to 300 kilograms of starch. Step 2, Marut. This means to shred the sago pith. After removing the bark of the sago palm, the sago pith will be placed on a lagon. What is a lagon? A lagon is made of two tied logs with a small gap in between as seen in the picture. A shredder will be then used to make pow, or in other words, shredded sago pith. Step 3, Murnyak, which is the extraction of sagu starch. The pow will be brought to the extraction house called Nianan, which is also known as Jagan. There the pow will be placed onto an edai which is a mat made of nipa leaves. The pow will be mixed with water from the river, which is drawn up using a terusuing, a conical bucket made of sago palm frond, known as akap balau. The extraction is done by trampling and kneading the wet pow barefoot. 
This produces a mixture of water and raw sago starch, known by the Merlinau people as A. This mixture will be collected in a settling container called jalor. After the say have settled on the bottom of the jalor, a small hole at the end of the jalor known as zirbut will be opened to drain all the water out. Step 4, Merlawik, the cleaning of say. The say at the bottom of jalor will be collected and placed on a cheesecloth known as the top hit, which is placed on a boat called Salui. The say is then washed and strained many times for any impurities to be removed. Step 5, Mungulid, to knead the ingredients for sago pearl. The raw sago starch or say will be mixed with shredded coconut, rice bran and salt to taste. The mixture will be kneaded on a special naipa mat called kurgen gun. The kneading process is done by rolling the mixture repeatedly on the kurgen gun. This kneading process is called mungulid. Step 6, Mungugo, a process to pearl sago starch by sifting. After mungulid, the mixture will be sifted using a colander that is suspended by rope, known by the Merlinau people as takurin. This forms the mixture into small round rings. Step 7, Muli, the cooking of sago pearl. The raw sago pearls are cooked on a clay oven called balunga. The raw sago pearls must be spread occasionally for them to be cooked evenly. The cooked sago pearls are then let to cool down and later to be stored in a tight container. The end product will look brownish and are called sagok, which can be eaten with smoked fish known as the jekinepuang, raw fish salad known as the umai, or with curry gravy known as kelisid. Besides the cultivation of sago gardens which is about 4 acres in area, the Merlinau attempted to grow swamp rice known as pod ipayas, and also orchards on the levees of the rivers. However, the northeast monsoon floods often ruined the rice crops, which again implies not be relied on for lasting subsistence. However, for those villages on the coast where the water was too saline for the sago palm flower extraction, they have no choice but to depend primarily on fishing and on the import and export trade. Next, we will be focusing on the next category that is the trading activities. When the river access was limited due to dangerous flooding during the northeast monsoon, the fishing-dependent coastal villagers cannot risk their lives against nature and have no choice but to initiate system barter with the other villages as the production of own products for subsistence ceases. They arranged expeditions upriver with the remaining stock of food ingredients, such as dried fish, salt, nipa palm sugar, and craft products, such as palm leaf thatch, mats, baskets, and hats to exchange these items for sago biscuit, fruit, canoes, and timber with the upriver villages. While for the upriver inland villages, they exported their sago biscuit and forest products, such as gums, resins, rattan and timber, in exchange for metal goods, weapons, ceramics, and cloth. This formed the basis of the traditional Merlinau economy. As time passes, the sago biscuit from the inland Merlinau villages soon became a delighted commodity and was exported under the auspices of aristocratic leaders from both inland and coastal Merlinau villages, together with the Malay traders from Brunei and elsewhere. However, the glorious days of trade domination soon came to an end. When Singapore is founded in 1819 and the big American and European cotton industry forces start demanding for cheap industrial starch, the sago export trade changed drastically. The conquest by the Raja of Sarawak in 1861 soon sped the process and lead to the replacement of the Merlinau and Malay carriers and traders by Chinese immigrants, who swarmed into the flour production to the extent that they were unstoppable and allowed to meet the demand of the market. Luckily, the government restricted the sale of land to immigrants, and the primary production of flour remained in the hands of the Merlinau people. This, however, did not last long when the industrialization hit after World War II. With machines taking over the production, many are rendered jobless. This leaves the garden in the Merlinau people's ownership. By the year 1900, the single cash crop had become the economic norm, and extensive changes had occurred in the social system of the Merlinau people. The Merlinau people are introduced to this solely market-driven economy system that is the single cash crop economy. This means that all crop which is grown is encouraged to be sold into the global market to meet the demand. Because of the lack of manpower to match the demand, they are soon replaced by machines and external parties that flood the shorelines. 
Hence, this ended the once famously controlled trade of the Sago plantation by the Melanau people. While the city and towns continued to grow and develop, the Melanau people migrated to these areas and expand their skills and their economical culture to the next level, leaving the population of the Melanau people to be limited. Next, we will be venturing in the industrial arts of the Merlinau indigenous people. Industrial arts refers to the practical arts, such as engineering, metalworking or carpentry. In any growing civilization, there's always a change to make life better. The fascinating thing is to see how humans can make use of their surroundings and make things functional. However, this doesn't just stop here. These functional arts started to help lives so much that the creation becomes part of an economy. In this topic, we will be looking at the carpentry, weaving, metalworking and pottery practiced by the Merlinau community. From houses to boats, they are skilled builders and can make basic equipment by sourcing natural resources from the forest such as timber and zago palm bark. They are also master sculptors and used their skills to sculpt ritual and belief sculptures which are practiced by the Oya Merlinau clan. For example, the Merlinau carpenters make the special epoch or spirit masks and wore them to symbolize the spirits during their rituals. They also make charms such as these small bone fishing charms to ensure a successful catch and were most often made by an individual for a specific purpose. They were rarely used after they had served their purpose and were often disposed of after the demise of the owner of the charm. From the Sarawak Museum Journal published by the Sarawak Museum Department in 1997, a collection of carvings is documented and shows the image of a malevolent spirit called Bellum. These sculptures are showcased on the British Museum website and are proofs of how skillful these Merlinau communities are in carpentry. The Merlinau people practiced weaving and used the craft products for trade, such as palm leaf thatch, mats, baskets, and hats. Besides, they also know how to weave cloths using a traditional loom and mastered the art of beading for accessories. Next, we will be looking into the land tenure system and laws on which Merlinau people stay peaceably with one another. The Land Audit, or the Village's Land Law, guides the community on rights within a village territorial domain, individual acquisition of land for cultivation, land boundaries and inheritance. For the Merlinau people, a delimited or fixed boundary territory is collectively owned and defensed by every Merlinau village. This means that outsiders are usually not welcomed. Sago gardens and orchards that are within the territory are carefully delimited and generally are individually owned, just like what has been practiced now. In the case, if a single garden is inherited by two women, joint tenancy is still possible as gardens are almost never subdivided. In general, the rights over a piece of land is secured by the individual or household within the village who first opens a certain forest area. Such rights are permanent with respect to the land finder and is heritable to the next generations. One can also own specific trees like the mungaris tree with wild bee nests or caves with bird nests where the rights to these natural resources fall to the descendants of the finder. The ownership of property will be incomplete without being indicated by a boundary. This boundary is defined and act as an important point of reference to handle a dispute within the community. In order to differentiate between ownership of individual plots to prevent such disputes, these plots are marked by natural boundaries, such as streams, watersheds, or ridges. Besides, physical markers which were planted like the rollock plant or erected like the hukku, which are large menhirs or stone pillars similar to an inter-village boundary. However, the land tenure laws of the Merlinau community faced opposition when the Sarawak state came into independence. The Article 13 under Malaysian Constitution 1957 states that no person may be deprived of property in accordance with the law, and no law may provide for compulsory acquisition or for the use of property without adequate compensation. However, there are still several issues relating to the Melanau native customary right lands, such as delay in processing applications for native title of land by the state government. 
Without a native title, the land of these indigenous people will not be protected and are vulnerable to land development. Besides, the Merlinau people are vulnerable to the absence of a transparent agreement with joint venture companies and fall into traps of unfair agreement and even faced non-payment of dividends for the land used by the joint venture companies. This vulnerable group of community is being exploited and have their own land rights stolen away. To make things unfair, some of these lands were included in areas subject to logging licenses. Even when a complaint is lodged by these community, there's inadequate to no compensation given for their land taken. This community hence have their daily sustenance disrupted and have to search for new land to hunt, to the point of compromising on their daily lives and drinking contaminated waters from polluted rivers, which resulted in many cases of deaths and sickness in their village, caused by a corrupted society. Therefore, the leaders of the Merlinau community step forth and form their first very own association, the Seroik Merlinau Association, in hopes to champion the voices of the Merlinau people and aims to help in the development of the community. Next, let's dive into the final topic, the division of labor practiced within the Merlinau community. Interestingly, each household was economically independent. The members of the household grew their own rice and other crops and were responsible for their own sustenance and prosperity. The tasks are usually divided between genders where the males will be handling work that requires strength and the females will be in charge of the making process. The Merlinau men tasks will include clearing the forest, planting, and maintaining the sago gardens. After the sago palm is ripe, they will be felling the ripe palm and bringing the trunks back into the village to be further processed. After that, the men will cut the trunks into segments and strip the bark off them before rasping the pith inside into a rough sawdust-like form. The rasped sawdust is then passed to the women to wash thoroughly on a platform over the river. This rasped pith is then placed on a fine woven mat on the platform, mixed with water, and trampled by the women barefooted, which allow the water with the flour in suspension to be forced through the mat, and a thin straining cloth onto draining boards leading to a trough below the platform, where the crude flour settles and surplus water is After drawn away. After the crude flour is being processed by the women, the women will be in charge of selling this crude flour produced to a Chinese dealer. The Chinese dealer did not usually pay cash, but entered the transaction in his books and allowed needed goods to be bought on credit from his retail shop. This ensures that his clients could be kept at regular work and that he could supply his creditors with a regular and predictable supply of flour for export. The earned proceeds of the sale are then divided in various ways between the owner of the palm, the male feller, and the female trampler of the pith. In the 1950s, this cottage industry, in which men and women controlled their own labor and profits, came to an end when Chinese dealers mechanized all aspects of the industry, except the growing and felling of palms. As only Merlinau males are allowed to own sago land, only those with sago gardens can have any part in the production of sago. This means that women or those who do not own sago lands are forced to leave their village in hopes of finding another sustainable job to survive. As their sole economy are being affected with the rise of machines displacing manpower jobs, many of the crops are also mortgaged before they become fully mature to meet the rising household expenditure. Hence, a large part of the male population is forced to leave the villages as migrant laborers in the lumber industry, where manpower is needed, while some others migrate permanently from their ancestral homeland in search for a more favorable future. With the industrialization of the sago production, women are no longer needed with the manufacturing process and are no longer economically independent. In conclusion, it is very important for documentation to be done for all these indigenous people in Malaysia to raise awareness of the effects of bad development planning.
With time and the neglect of social development in these communities, these communities struggled to earn a living and chose not to just leave their homeland for better opportunities, but their identity and culture as well. Most of them are unskilled and unaware of the competitive urban life and end up left behind in a foreign place, contributing to the nation's percentage of the poor community. Some of them who can afford the trip back chose to go back to their homeland, considering that the jungle can better provide their daily needs. However, there are some groups of indigenous people who are not so lucky as their homeland is forcibly taken away from them by development or illegal logging and pollution, rendering them cut off from their daily needs. Hence, it is vital for us to take care of our environment and the land that we dearly love, as our actions can either impact or destroy lives. It is also important for us to collect as much information as possible for this limited population to ensure that Malaysia's diversity will not be forgotten by the next generation. So, this ends our series on Malaysia's Merlinau indigenous people, and thank you for your time. We hope that you enjoyed our research and presentation. Before we end, we would like to thank all these sources for providing us with information and clips to make our assignment presentation possible. Thank you for making Series 4 video a reality.